Welcome to worship. Glad that you are here this morning. A few announcements we'll make as we get started. We'd like to find out who is in worship uh, today. The way we do this is there are a few pads on the inside out of every pew. We invite members and guests. Uh, if you can take a few pads, write your name down, give us your contact information, check the appropriate boxes, and then send it down so everybody has a chance to fill that out on your pew. Uh, this helps us get to know you a little bit better, give us uh, any updated contact information. Uh, we do ask once it gets to the end of your pew, everybody's had a chance to fill that out, if you can send it back to where it got started. We do ask that first person, when it comes back to you, if you could tear out the pages that we use today, uh, that will help our ushers collect those at the end of the service. A few announcements we'll make when we get started. Uh, we are having children's time today. That's right after hymn number 334. Uh, we kids right down here for a few moments. Also, brief support uh, is meeting today at 3 o'clock in the conference room. I uh, want you to make a note of that. Uh, several other things are listed here upcoming events as well as opportunities for the week. Uh, I want to recognize uh, Donna. Donna I am aware that there are a lot of questions about the church directory and I didn't want to be silent about it, but um, I don't have a good answer about when we're going to have them. Um, I have been in contact with the company that is producing the directory. And on Friday, actually, before I left my office, I uh, wrote them a rather lengthy, very direct to the point email. <laughs> so I will follow up on that Monday morning. But um, there, there's been a lot of back and forth. Um, didn't have the roster in the right format, and then uh, didn't have birthdays, which was something that they had said we would have beneath all the photos. It, it's just been, it's been a little bit diff difficult, but um, the, the short answer is I think we'll have them soon. I just don't know exactly when. So I'm on top of it. I'm, I'm staying in contact with them, and um, I hope that they'll be great when we get them. So just know that I'm, I'm working on it, I'm staying in contact with them, and I apologize. But I, I do think it'll be fairly soon. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Direct email from Don. I guarantee you they will be here very, very soon. <laughs> and you can tell them that we built a gym in the time that they has taken them to do this. <laughs> just, just say it, just say it. Have you noticed we got a big building out there? Uh, it's close, it's very close. Many of the construction projects are winding down in the next several weeks, and it is, it is a very good time at that college park. We want to say a special welcome to our guests this morning. Uh, you've already given us your information on the few pad just a moment ago, we appreciate that. Uh, if you're a guest, uh, ushers are coming down the aisles now. Uh, we'd like, please just raise your hand if you're a guest. They will recognize you and give you a packet of information. Uh, inside this packet, you'll find a, a letter from our pastor welcoming you to our church. Also, a, a little bit of the history or the story of College Park and a newsletter that tells you what's going on in the life of our church. So thank you for being a part of the worship this day. All right. Speaking of the rest, you know, sometimes the problem with Lent is it makes me get real serious about sin in my life. As I look at the cross and what Jesus endured for me, I don't always like what I see. God takes our sin head on. And I wonder this morning, what what's in my life and what's in your life that he's trying to speak to because whatever we've been holding on to if we would let it go how much more would we be like Christ how much more would our life have to be like Christ so this morning as, as we prepare for worship as we consider the season of Lent that we're in God has been trying to get our attention 
you may to let it go. Let's prepare for worship. <laughs>
For without you, worship is pointless. Hear us. Watch us. Be with us as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. And Jesus is in the boat, and he's asleep. 
And then he gets up, and what does he do? All right, man, you already know the story. You need to come up here with me, all right? You're going to play the part of Jesus this morning, all right? No, you don't fall asleep. All right, all right, do it. All right, you can, you can put your head like this. You like that. All right, Jesus is, can y'all get, y'all are in the boat with me, okay? We're in the boat together, all right? Now, when the, when the winds and the waves start, I need for y'all to go, oh. okay? You might got to look scared. Okay, but you got to do it frozen. Are you ready? Let me see your best scared look. Okay, good. All right, those are pretty good. All right. In just a minute, you're going to say it real loud. Peace, be still. All right? And when they're doing the wind and the wave, and you say, peace, be still, y'all, be still. Let's see if this works. Are you ready? You think you can handle this? Okay, so we're riding in the boat. Riding in the boat. And then all of a sudden, the wind.
Father, you are the creator of the world, and you have dominion over all of creation. You are ruler of the nations and of our lives. Your greatness is beyond anything we can understand or imagine. Yet you choose to love each of us. You supply all our needs, and you give us joy, hope, and peace as we journey through life. Forgive us, God, when we see only the circumstances of our lives and not you in the midst of them. Forgive us for forgetting that you are in control. Forgive us for forgetting that you care about each of us. Forgive us for not trusting you when things get hard. Father, forgive us for thinking small thoughts of you. Teach us to trust you in all things at all times. Thank you for loving us and caring for us. Amen. And our assurance of heart comes from the wonderful words found in Isaiah 55, 6 through 13. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So it's my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the fields of the trees will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be a sign for the Lord's renown for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. May God add his blessing to the reading of this, his wonderful and holy word.
the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Just finishing and singing this song, He Leaveth Me, I couldn't help but think about GPSs. You know, to me, that's one of the most wonderful inventions that's been in, uh, that's come around because I usually drive in circles, not knowing where to go. So it has surely saved uh, me from a lot of time and saved a lot of gas through the years since we've been able to have one. After singing this song, I couldn't help but think about our spiritual GPS. You know, as long as you put the right direction in the GPS, it'll get you there. Maybe not the way you want to go, and it might not take you um, exactly the same time that you would like to get there, but it'll get you there if you just keep on driving. You might hear that calculation um, quite a bit. I've heard that quite often, but you still will get there. What about our spiritual GPS? When every morning, what do we punch in? We get asked, where to go? Do we go to God? You know, if we are really plugged in, if we really truly go to God every morning, and if we follow His directions, not just listen, but follow, it'll be amazing what our work can accomplish. May we pray. Lord, we come to you this morning with such grateful hearts for all of your love and care for each of us. Lord, we know that each of us bears burdens and each of us have warts that we have developed through the years, but you love us no matter what and you accept us as we are and we praise you for that. Lord, we know as a nation and as a people we have been blessed with many things, and we know that we owe everything that we have to you. Help us at this time of the service to be generous with our tithes and with our offerings. And Lord, bless the gift and the giver. And thank you for loving and caring for each of us. Forgive us of our many times that we fail to listen to you. Amen.
Now we have telltale signs of that when the college young men and ladies start coming home on spring break, and uh, we will have a parade of them over the next couple of weeks, and we're excited about that. And our young people migrate back down to the front. You know that it's uh, spring's here soon, right? All right, buddy. Good deal. We are in our Lenten journey, and it is it is truly a time of reflection. And as I said, we're in the fourth week of of the way, the series that we're going through. Do you remember what the first week was about? Baptism. Baptism, Baptism preparation, and temptation. That's right. Exactly right. Week number two. Cricket. Healing. That's right. That's right. You remember that Jesus was rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. He went to Capernaum and then there began kind of a healing ministry. They were on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. Much, much excitement began as, as he began healing. People came from all over uh, for that time of healing. Last week we talked about proclaiming the kingdom and specifically about Good to know they have an impact. <laughs> the Sermon on the Mount. Remember the wise man who? Okay, all right. Well, maybe you weren't here, but but we talked about the Sermon on the on the Mount and, and the teaching of Jesus and how the, the the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is present, but it's also a future reality and it's built upon uh, the teachings, the truth uh, that Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. Today, as you might have guessed from our children's sermon. Uh, we are going to talk about the, the story of, of Jesus calming the storm. It's recorded in, in several of the Gospels, but we're going to read from Mark. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. So I'll give you a moment if you're not already there uh, to turn over to Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35, and we'll read it down to verse 41. It's, it's actually a very short, uh, very short story compared to last week with all of chapter 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, but, but uh, we'll read these verses. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. <clears throat> Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the, the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, he rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wave died down, excuse me, the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified. And they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey you. Who is this? Even the wind and the waves will bathe. Once again, we, we find ourselves on, in a story that occurred on or near, in our particular case, on the Sea of Galilee. By the water there, on the water. Now, remember a couple of weeks ago, the, the Sea of Galilee really is, is more like what we would call a big lake. Right? It's called the Sea of Galilee in some places. In John chapter 21, it's called the Sea of Tiberias. But in Luke chapter 5, it's called the Lake of Gennesaret, which, which is probably a little more descriptive. Uh, it is more like a big lake than it is perhaps like a sea that we would think about it. But it is, it is a frequent setting for our gospel stories because we know that Jesus had kind of made his, moved his hometown base to the Burn, which is there on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the, the Sea of Galilee is only 13 miles long which is not very large for a, sea of, for a body of water. 13 miles long, 7 miles wide. So when he said we're going to cross over, if they went from, from due west to due east, which is doubtful <coughs> that he was probably come from Capernaum to some, some point below that. But it, I mean, even 7 miles across, that's just good water skiing distance. Okay, It's really not a long distance. And, and you have to remember again that the, the Sea of Galilee was a place where Jesus' disciples fished. It was, it was an important economic hub for them. They fished there. Teaching and miracles occurred on its water. And Jesus took a boat across the lake when he needed time, when he needed retreat time, when he wanted to get away. It happened on several occasions that we have recorded in the gospel. 
He wanted to get away. He wanted to pray. So he's traveling on water. And in this week's lesson, Jesus continues with the twin themes that we've been going through all through the way. The first thing is this. Jesus stands in our shoes. Once again, he's standing in our shoes. Right? Whatever we undertake in life, whatever befalls our path in life, understand, Jesus has walked this earth. He's been there, done that. So when we say, how can God possibly understand? No, God in person, Jesus Christ. He's walked here. That's thing number one. Thing number two is that even though he walked here, he, he, he was reign, God reigns over all of creation. He had the power over creation, which is remarkable if you think about it. You know, sometimes we forget who we're dealing with. A couple weeks ago, I, I, I talked about as the city took, the people of the city took Jesus over and, and wanted to cast him over the cliff. You remember that? And, and he just walked through the crowd went about his way. I said, sometimes we forget who we're dealing with. We are dealing with Jesus Christ, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Sometimes we forget. We get a little too chummy in the sense we lose that respect and that awe of who Jesus is. He has reigned over all of creation and he demonstrates that again today. Now let's back up for just a minute. Luke chapter 5 gives us a little backdrop information. All right, in Luke chapter 5, Jesus asked to use Simon Peter's boat. They're there at the side of the, of the lake of the Sea of Galilee, and he asked to use Simon Peter's boat as a platform to speak from. The crowd was so large, he wanted to get out in the water a little bit to where he could see him, and they could see him. And so he, he asked to use the, the boat that Peter had been fishing in all night long. Well, you know Peter by this point is probably like, Lord, I, I really just like to go to sleep. Well, I really like to But since we asked him, I said, okay, all right. We'll, we'll work it out. Okay, so, so they let him use, they let Jesus use the boat as this kind of a preaching platform. And, and to give Peter, to thank him, Jesus kind of throws him a bone, or in this case, a fish, if you will. He throws him a fish. He tells him where to cast his net. I, I, and you know what must be going through Peter's mind. Okay, you're a carpenter for sure. I've been fishing all night. But yeah, sure, I'll be glad to go do that. But whatever his reservations were, he goes and he does it. And we know from the story he had this, I mean, the, the fishing trip of his life. More fish than they could handle. Mega fish. Peter hauled in all of these fish. And in doing this, Jesus shared in the struggles of this working fisherman who no doubt was frustrated from an unproductive night of fishing. He shared in that, and he allowed Peter to get a glimpse of a world beyond this one. A world where, well, we just can't imagine. But he gives us glimpses all through Scripture of what it would be like. Later on, after Peter and his buddies and the other disciples had joined in with Jesus, they find themselves in this predicament. They're on the boat, they're crossing the, the lake at night in the middle of a fierce storm. You, you've probably heard me talk about this before in the last couple of years, talk about the geographical reasons why storms are pretty common in this region, particularly over the lake. But let, me, let me give you, let me go back and kind of build the story for you. Well, remember last year we were talking about the mountains? You know, you went up on the Sermon on the Mount, I said that, that this area is kind of ringed with mountains. Well, that, that is true. You know, above the, of the Sea of Galilee, there, there, there's several mountains around. But, but there's also a couple of troughs that, that go that cut through the mountain area. And there are a couple of very major troughs that kind of lead in, valleys that lead in to the Sea of Galilee. So the, the, the winds come off the Mediterranean. You have these westerly gusts that arrive there in the evening, turning the lake, what would normally be a pretty calm, placid lake, into a very raging surface. So you have these huge waves that, that can be built up. Now you couple that with the fact that the lake is 682 feet below sea level. All right? We're at about 900 something here, I think, Mr. Slater. I think that's about right. About 900 feet above sea level, give or take some. We're talking about dropping to 682 feet below sea level. And what that does is it makes this area very susceptible to downdrafts the cool air comes across the Golden Heights and it meets that warm air coming off the lake, coming through these troughs, 
And you know what happens when really warm air meets really cool air? Yeah, really violent storms. Especially if you've got water underneath it to fuel it. And, and, and so this was, this was very common for this area. And, and the, the disciples, at least a few of them, were fishermen. They'd been out on the lake in these type of storms. Or maybe not this severe, but, but storms. The other guys in the boat lived in the area. They knew that this was possible. It was not uncommon to see it. So you've got this unusually frightening storm because these are guys that have seen it happen over and over and over again. It's a natural cycle of where they live. But yet they were scared to death. They were screaming like little girls when they went back to wake up Jesus. They were scared to death. Now let's talk about the boat. Uh, an ancient boat was discovered buried in the silt of, of the Sea of Galilee there after a prolonged dry season. And what we found out was something pretty, pretty fascinating. It has allowed us to kind of look at what kind of boat Jesus and his disciples may have been riding in. And, and you can see, you can Google some search and see an actual picture of the boat that they dug up out of the Sea of Galilee, out of the silt there. It, it really is interesting. They, they, they carbon 14 tested this boat. And they know that the boat dated back somewhere between 100 B.C. and 40 A.D. It's not really that precise, okay? I understand, that's 140 years with them. But after they, after they got the, the carbon testing done, they found this oil lamp. And they dated the oil lamp back to the mid-first century B.C. You go, well, that's too early for our story. But then they found some coins on the boat that were dated between 29 and 30 A.D which is spot on. So we know that this is a boat that would probably have been typical of the time that this story occurred. And you say, well, Randy, why is that important? Well, it's important because we get a glimpse. The boat was 25 and a half feet long. Okay, we're talking something maybe from here to the organ. Okay? Is that about 25 feet wide? Look at Okay. I could have someone to lie down. Okay. All right, 25 and a half feet long. Seven and a half feet wide, which would be about the width of the, of the stage here, okay, and four and a half feet deep. And, and it had it had like decks on the back as well as the front. Okay, it had little decks there. So we know from the story that Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat. Now it doesn't say whether he was on top of that deck or whether he was lying under it, but he had his he was comfy. He had his head on a cushion. Scripture tells us that. He, I mean, he was asleep, undisturbed, until the disciples start screaming, right? Now, the, the, the boat information here is, is for free. It's a bonus just because you came here today, all right? But for those of you who are visual learners, it helps you to understand. You can probably put 8, 10, maybe 12 people in, in a boat like they found. That's about right. They say maybe about a ton of cargo. So if you think about maybe one person in, in and a ton of cargo. We know that it had sails. They, they were driven by sails or by oars, either one. So that kind of gives you an idea of what they were doing. But they may have been sailing out there, and when this wind came up, they had to strike the sail and, and just start praying. And they screamed for Jesus, and Jesus is asleep. And when they woke him up, he stood up, and, and in a word, literally, in a word, he called the sea, and the wind quit. But, but the strength of that word in the original language, it, it wasn't quite, well, you know, y'all hold it down. No, it was very stern, you know, be quiet, be still. And it was just like it was here when Caleb gave us the command. It was quiet, it was calm. Some commentators suggest the storm must have been supernatural in its intensity based on the reaction of the fishermen and the strength of Jesus' commands. And that may be, I don't know, that may be. But I think the main point is that in the book of Mark, consistently, Jesus is repeatedly represented as teaching, exercising, and demonstrating trust in God. Have faith in God. Trust in Him. And it makes sense. You, you'll remember that a lot of the surviving examples we have of ancient literature. What does water represent? Any thoughts? Chaos. Yeah, chaos. Unpredictable. Um, you know, 
Don't go out there, you'll fall off the end of the world. You know, they, they could see the water, but they didn't know what was beyond that. And so in their mind, it was chaos. It was unpredictable. If you remember the creation story, God's spirit was hovering over the deep waters, and God brought order out of the chaos, demonstrating his power and his reign over all of creation, all of all, all the cosmos. Later, you remember the story, God parted the sea to allow a group of emancipated slaves to, to freedom, lead them to freedom, and destroy the powerful army in the Before Jesus' ministry emphasized these things, God was showing. He was identifying with the lowly, the oppressed, and exercising and demonstrating authority over all of creation. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing when he called the storm that scared his disciples. Now we can stop there and be a great sermon, but I'm not going to. <laughs> because I found something in verse 36. That fascinated me. I don't know why I didn't read it. I, I, I did read it before, but I don't know why I didn't land on it before. In the second half of verse 36, if you still have your Bible, look at those words. There were also other boats with him. Did you notice that when I read it a few minutes ago? We kind of skip over it. We read the story so much, we hear it so much, we don't notice that. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. It wasn't just their boat out on the water. And I want to know, and I need to have an eye I want to know who was in the other boats, what they saw, what they experienced. If they can hear Jesus scream out over the wind and the waves. And what they thought about this deal. What it tells me is that Jesus' ministry wasn't just about 12 guys in his boat. It wasn't just about them. There was a, an ever-widening circle of influence, an ever-widening circle of ministry these people got to see that. They got to see this miracle on the water. You know? I, I wish I'd been there. Knowing the outcome. <laughs> I wish I'd been there. You know, this widening circle of people, they were becoming an important part of this journey. In a similar story, Jesus had sent the disciples ahead across the lake. You know this story. Same way, it was that night, they found themselves again in a storm. As, as I said, it was very common. Was it the same storm? No, it wasn't. It was not. I mean, for, for some of the time, to emergency too, sorry, completely different context, completely different circumstances. <laughs> this time, Jesus sends the disciples ahead and said, I'll catch up with you. And you know, the disciples were probably thinking, huh? <laughs> you'll, do, you'll do what? But he did. He caught up with them, walking on the water. And who's our boy that got to go out and walk on the water with us? Peter. Peter. That's right. Peter got to walk on the water. And you'll remember the story as it unfolds as long as he was looking at what? Jesus. Jesus. As long as he was looking at Jesus, he did fine. When his eyes were on Jesus, focused on God become man, he did fine. It was when he looked at the storm, it was when he looked at his circumstances and took his eyes off Jesus that it started to become sharp way. <laughs> Bad news. Bad news. But as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, as long as he acknowledged that God was in control, through God's power, he taught us that we too can rise above the chaos of life and participate in God's work to make order out of chaos. Those are important lessons for us as we walk in the way, as we walk in His way. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, we ask for your forgiveness when we lose sight of who you are. 
when somehow we think that our problems are too big for you to handle. <laughs> oh, Father, they're, they're all too big for us to handle. But we know that you, that you can, you can handle all of them. And that as we can keep our eyes on you, we can rise above. Whatever the storm may be, because we know they'll come. Whatever the chaos may be, because we know that it happens. God, allow us to see you through the storm. Allow us to see your power at work around us. If we just pay attention. Allow us to join you in the work of your miracles that take place every day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We serve a God who is powerful. A God who desires a personal relationship with us. And if you do not have that personal relationship, let me tell you, this morning, I'll be here in a moment. We want to sing a hymn, have faith in God. Very appropriate. We'll have a sing, sing, have faith in God. I invite you to have faith in God and to receive the gift of Jesus Christ and His Son. If you're here and you say, Randy, I, I am a believer, but boy, I, I, I find myself just consumed with, with life circumstances. And I want to be more attuned to God. That is, that's a great prayer. Just lift it up to the Father and let Him, let him walk you through. If you're like I am, I'll be glad to talk with you and pray with you. If you're here and you'd like to be a member of this church, there are a lot of ways you can receive them. I'd be glad to share that with you. But as we stand and sing together, let me challenge you. Do business with God. Confess your sin to Him, uh, your shortcomings, your lack of faith, all of those things. Talk with Him about it, even as, as you sing, uh, and, and offer it up to Him.
invite you to turn to your neighbors, greet one another, encourage one another uh, as we leave and go into our mission field. Amen? Let's pray together. Gracious Father, thank you for this day. Father, it is a glorious day. It's an opportunity to praise you and to serve you. Father, as we go from this place, challenge us. Show us. Illuminate our path. Show us those opportunities that you place before us for ministering in your name. For it's in Jesus' name that we ask all of these things.